Welcome to the program, An Introduction to Commercial Real Estate Valuation and Financial Analysis. That's a mouthful, isn't it? I'm your host, Lauren Keim, with Real Estate's Next Level Education and with Lehigh University's Goodman Center for Real Estate Studies. Certainly you've heard the terms cap rate, gross rent multiplier, cash on cash return, or return on investment. But what do they really mean? And how does a professional commercial realtor or an investment advisor or even an investor determine what a property is really worth. Today we're going to discuss the various methods of valuing commercial and investment real estate and we're going to introduce you to financial analysis for real estate. This workshop's not nearly as fun or entertaining as our marketing property workshop or our listing presentation workshop, objection handling, or even our data gathering workshops. But understanding the numbers, the returns, the income streams is vital. It's central to commercial and investment real estate. We're going to be exploring some mathematical formulas during this program. And normally, when I start talking about financial analysis, I have to duct tape my head so that if it explodes, the pieces stay together. But basic financial analysis isn't as challenging as you might think. The author of The Psychology of Winning, the brilliant Dr. Dennis Waitley, wrote, there never was a winner who wasn't a beginner. Commercial and investment real estate math looks complicated, but stick with me and you'll learn it. I'll start today by explaining that all commercial real estate is an investment. Although some buyers of commercial property use the property for their small business or their personal use, and other buyers are strictly investors looking for a return, both consider the property to be an investment. A property user or an end user purchases or leases commercial real estate in order to have a place to establish, conduct, or house their business. The user's return or their investment might be directly from their business income or their return on their investment in the property may be a combination of what they receive in appreciation and equity in the property and what they receive as a return on their business assets. Straight investors who do not occupy the property purchase real estate in order to realize a return on their investment on that property. Part of that return is captured in cash flow and part of that return is appreciation and equity buildup. And it's ultimately realized when the property is eventually sold. You will also meet clients who are a combination of user and purchaser who will purchase more real estate than is needed for their business in order to obtain a return above and beyond their personal business. Now, entire courses exist on real estate investment analysis. Our goal in this program is to introduce you to the concept of income and cash flows, the primary methods of calculating return on investment, and how they're important to property valuation and the marketing and sale of commercial real estate. We're going to outline the various forms of calculating returns on investment and the resultant property valuation based on those rates of return. But an in-depth analysis of income projection will be in our advanced training program. Now remember, as we go through the various forms of price analyses, that a commercial real estate investment might be an office building or a shopping center, a skyscraper or a corner store, a large commercial farm, a hotel, a golf course, an apartment complex, or many other types of property. So let's start by examining how we value commercial real estate and why investors use so many different terms and methods. An appraiser is supposed to be the arbiter of value of any transaction. Now this is one of my favorite appraisers, Wassel. And Wassel would say that an appraiser is an impartial third party who bases their evaluation of a particular piece of real estate on something called fair market value. This appraised value or fair market value is supposed to be based on the most probable price a property will sell for in an open market where the buyer and seller are each knowledgeable, they're not under duress, or they're not affected by some other stress that would impact the price. The market value of that property might be higher or lower to a particular buyer based on their circumstances, however. An appraiser estimates the value of the property based on a combination of sales, comparable rentals, the cost to reconstruct the property, as well as the income of the property. Investors, on the other hand, are typically more interested in the potential income and the potential return on their investment in that property. The value of any building is based on several principles, including the principle of highest and best use, the principle of supply and demand, and the principle of substitution. So let's go through them. The principle of highest and best use states that a property's value is related to the use that's most profitable for that property or the use that's likely to produce the greatest net return. That use has to be physically possible, legally permissible, 
and financially feasible. For example, a pharmacy like CVS or Walgreens might pay more for a great corner location, a great corner property, than a gas station or a mini mart would. And that gas station or mini mart might pay more than McDonald's or Burger King. That's all based on what kind of income each can generate in that location. We're looking for that highest and best use that nets the most for the property owner. The second principle, the principle of supply and demand, states that sales prices increase as supply decreases or as demand increases, which both amount to too few properties for too many buyers. The alternative is that prices decrease if supply increases or demand decreases. So, if there are five buyers that really want to purchase one particular commercial property, they're likely to bid that price up. This leads to a reduction or compression in cap rates, which we'll explain later in the program. However, if there's only one buyer for a particular type of property in a particular location and there are five for sale, then there's downward pressure on the price on those properties, on those property sellers who are competing for the one buyer in that market. The third principle, the principle of substitution, states that the value of property tends to be set by the cost of acquiring an equally desirable substitute property. In other words, a buyer is unlikely to pay more for a property than it would cost to purchase a similar property. Now, although every piece of real estate is unique, if there are two similar sized buildings on the same block, on the same street, and one sells for half a million, what would you pay for the same building next door? Using these principles, an appraiser typically makes their determination of value by using several methods of comparison with other recently sold commercial or investment properties in the same general area and as the same type as the property being sold. In their final report to the lender or to the buyer, they'll reconcile the three different approaches and give different weights to each. The primary three methods of comparison are the market data or sales comparison approach, the reconstruction or cost approach, and the income method. The market data approach or sales comparison approach is a comparison of property to other properties of similar size, similar condition, and in the same area. Evaluating the property entails adjusting the value of the building by adding and subtracting for size, for amenities, and for condition in comparison to other recently sold properties in the market. Some investors use a market data approach by trying to evaluate a property by comparing a price per square foot of an office building or retail space or a price per unit for multifamily properties, or maybe a price per room for hotels and hospitality properties. If downtown building, if a downtown building in Las Cruces, New Mexico, is selling for about $100 a square foot, then it's likely that the building you're trying to evaluate the same area will be close to that range. This only works if you compare apples to apples. If you're a residential agent and someone asks you for a price per square foot for a new four bedroom, two and a half bath colonial, you might be able to give a range, right? But the actual price per square foot is based on the quality of construction, the builder and the neighborhood. If you're evaluating office buildings, for example, you only compare with other buildings in the same area and the same condition, class A or class B. You can ballpark what a building might be worth. The same is true for any type of commercial property. If you're comparing the price per room of a hotel, make sure it's the same quality of hotel in the same market before trying to compare it by room. Don't compare a Ritz-Carlton to a Motel 6. They're not the same animal. Second, the reconstruction cost, less depreciation, is the second method appraisers use, and it determines value by estimating the value of the land under the commercial building, and then adding the cost to rebuild the building at current market prices. The appraiser then subtracts the physical depreciation, such as wear, tear, and age, and any functional obsolescence, which means that new buildings may have features that older buildings do not, this is often a useful comparison if the building being purchased is relatively new or to assist a buyer with comparison when considering purchasing an existing commercial building or constructing a new building. And finally, the income method. As part of the appraisal, the income approach is still based on similar properties in the same area, but the comparison is strictly by the income generated by the property in comparison to the income generated by similar properties recently sold in the market. If, for example, an appraiser finds that most properties are selling between 10 and 12 times their net income, then the value of this commercial property probably lies in the same range. So when I say income approach, does that mean we're valuing a property by cap rate? 
or by cash on cash return or gross income multiplier or internal rate of return. I'm going to start by outlining the different components of the income equation and step through each of the terms that you'll need to know to walk and talk like a commercial investment realtor. And then we'll be able to use those components to understand the different ways of measuring the return of an investment. We're going to start with valuing a property by gross income multiplier, then take it a step further to cap rate, which is based on the net operating income, then we'll drill down to cash on cash return, and finally look at discounted cash flow formulas, what net present value means, and the internal rate of return on an investment property. We'll also look at some other important components of evaluating and financing a building, including debt coverage ratio. So let's start with how much money is coming in on a property. We'll call it gross scheduled income or GSI. Gross scheduled income is the total income a property could generate if the entire building were rented. And if we're talking about a multi-unit investment property, it would mean all of the units are rented all of the time. If we're talking about an office building, it means that all the rentable square footage is leased. This number is computed by adding all the rents from all the occupied units and adding the market rent for any unrented units. Although gross scheduled income could refer to monthly income, it's generally used to describe yearly income. So the rent is then multiplied by 12. If, for example, you have a building with 10 units and each unit rents for $1,000 a month, that would mean that if all units were rented all the time, you'd receive a gross income of $10,000 a month or $120,000 per year. That would be your GSI or your gross scheduled income. As an example of an office building, you might have a 12,000 square foot office building where 10,000 square feet is rentable space. And that happens, by the way, because some space is common area, such as elevators, a lobby, uh, room for your HVAC systems, and so on. So let's assume 10,000 square feet of rentable space is rented at $12 per square foot per year, which sounds really low to everyone in New York City and a little high for some of those who are in the Midwest. For those of you new to commercial real estate, when you hear a per square foot price for office, retail, or warehouse space, it's generally meant per year, not per month. Multiply $12 by 10,000 square feet and you'll receive a gross income of $120,000 each year if every rentable square foot is rented all year long. In reality, tenants do leave. And sometimes space sits vacant for a while. And sometimes, in order to attract a tenant to your office building or your shopping center, you have to make some concessions and perhaps give a few months free rent. So it's unlikely during the time someone owns the building, called a holding period, that it remains 100% occupied 100% of the time. Because of this, if we're going to truly represent our clients with accurate information, we have to reduce the gross scheduled income by some vacancy factor. This factor is different for different property types and in different markets across the country and around the globe. There are several methods to determine what an appropriate vacancy rate might be. You could survey surrounding buildings, call the owners or the property managers to verify the amount of rentable space and the amount of vacancy and average it. You could research on CoStar or a local commercial information exchange like Catalyst or Comrex if you happen to have one in your region. The simplest method is to average the last three years vacancy on the building itself. If the building was vacant 5% of the time each of the last three years, it'll probably continue to be vacant 5% of the time unless something is shifting in the area. One of the best methods to ballpark the typical vacancy rate is to call several commercial lenders. Commercial lenders when they're underwriting a loan on a building have standard factors they use based on the property type, the location, and the market conditions. They're often your best source for this kind of information locally. Whatever you determine is the vacancy rate, take that percentage off your gross scheduled income to find a more accurate picture of what a commercial property buyer is likely to actually receive in rents during their holding period. There is one caveat, by the way. If your typical vacancy rate in the area is 7%, but your building has been half empty for the last five years, then use the actual income as your effective gross income. But Lauren, you might say, the building could make so much more money if it were fully leased. Then why is it half empty? There's an issue that has to be addressed. In most cases, though, simply take off the vacancy rate from the gross scheduled income. Now, let's go back to our office building example. We had a gross scheduled income of $120,000 per year. If a typical vacancy rate in the area is 7%, 
we reduce the income by 7% or $8,400, which gives us $111,600. This number is our effective gross income, or some might say just gross income. If you're pricing office buildings or retail space, one other factor you may have to take off to arrive at an effective gross income are rent abatements. Often in order to attract a long-term tenant to an office building or to a shopping center, a landlord may incentivize a tenant by offering some period of time free, maybe a month or two. If there are any rent abatement incentives in your market that may apply to your building you're trying to price, you should also reduce your estimated income by what you expect the abatement to be in order to arrive at your effective gross income. At this point in the equation, we have our first number for calculating value. Having the gross income allows us to compute our first income value comparison, which is called a gross rent multiplier. Although I strongly recommend you do not use this as a valuation method to compare commercial properties, I will explain it because there are many realtors, investors, and managers using the term. The gross rent multiplier, or GRM, is simply the sales price of the building divided by the gross income. For example, if you're trying to price an apartment complex and you found three other apartment complexes that have sold recently and you know the gross income of each complex, you can compute a rough gross rent multiplier for the area and you can use that to ballpark the value of the building you're trying to price. Let's do a quick example. In our research, we identify three comparable apartment complexes that have sold recently. The first complex is 30 units, and it's got a gross income of $360,000 a year, and it just sold for $3.672 million. Again, to get the gross rent multiplier, we divide the price by the effective gross rent. Dividing $3.672 million by $360,000 gives us a gross rent multiplier of 10.2. The second complex is 25 units, and it sold for $2.499 million, with a gross yearly income of $255,000. If you divide 2.499 million by 255,000, we get a GRM of 9.8. Finally, the third building sells for 6.1425 million, that's 50 units, and carries a gross yearly income of 585,000. That gives us a GRM of 10.5. If we average these three comps, our gross rent multiplier is 10.17. So how does that help us value the property we're trying to price? If we know the gross income of a building we're trying to price, and we know a range of GRMs, we can do simple division and get a range. If the income of our building is $400,000, and the range of gross rent multipliers on comparable buildings is 9.8 to 10.5, we have a value range of $3.92 million to $4.2 million. Based on the average gross rent multiplier, which happens to be 10.17, the value would likely be $4.068 million. This is an easy calculation and only requires a realtor or an investor to know the gross rental income and the sales or list prices. But I hesitate to use it because it's often incorrect. The issue is that an investor is looking for a true return on their investment and gross rent multipliers calculated before any expenses are taken off the building. Expenses can vary dramatically from building to building which affects your bottom line numbers so I really don't like using GRM. So what's the next level of the equation? Taking off the operating expenses the property owner pays to manage and maintain the building can get us closer to an actual return. So what are operating expenses? Operating expenses are those expenses that must be paid by the owner to operate and maintain the property. Operating expenses include property taxes, property insurance, uh, utilities paid by the owner, maintenance and management fees, these expenses do not include the principal and interest of the mortgage payment. These expenses also do not include any tenant paid expenses, simply because they're not paid by the owner. In the example of a six unit office building, if the electric is separated to the individual units and the tenants are paying for that electric usage, that utility cost is not part of the operating expenses. However, if there's a common hallway, common bathrooms, and an elevator, the owner or landlord should have a separate electric meter and those electric utility costs are part of the operating expense. When selling retail or office properties, tenants often pay something called common area maintenance fees or CAM fees, which help to cover the expenses paid by the owner of the property. If these expenses are reimbursed by the tenants as CAM fees, they're either not part of the operating expenses or the CAM fees are added back into the scheduled gross income. But we'll discuss that in more detail in our advanced program. 
Operating expenses must be accurately determined or estimated in order to accurately price a property for a seller or to assist a buyer in determining the property's real investment return. These expenses fall into two categories, fixed expenses and variable expenses, and it's important that you know the distinctions between them. Fixed expenses are those expenses that do not change regardless of whether or not the property is occupied. Property taxes and property insurance are considered fixed expenses. These are expenses that may fluctuate from year to year, but generally they remain stable for the entire year. And the owner will pay those expenses whether or not there's a single tenant in the building. Other expenses that may be fixed are snow removal, lawn care, security, and pest control. Variable expenses are any expenses paid by the owner or landlord that will increase or decrease depending on the occupancy of the property. Typically, these expenses also fluctuate from month to month. Utility expenses such as electric, heat, gas, water, and sewer are all typically variable expenses. If someone occupies a unit, they're far more likely to turn up the heat or flush the toilet. Contracted services such as property management and cleaning may also be variable expenses. And garbage may be a fixed or may be a variable expense depending on whether it's municipal or contracted garbage. There is a third type of expense called a reserve. At some point in time, the roof will have to be replaced, the parking lot has to be repaved, and the central air unit has to be replaced, and the bathrooms really need to be updated in the property. In order to fully account for any expenses that will be incurred in the future, a reserve fund should be set up by the owner or the landlord. As you're calculating the cost of operating the property, a yearly reserve toward maintenance, repairs, and updates should be included as part of the expenses. When estimating the true and correct net operating income, NOI, after operating expenses, many real estate professionals who are representing their sellers neglect to include an amount for reserves toward the building maintenance, repairs, and updates. This is because the listing agent wants to show the return on investment to be the highest number possible in order to attract potential buyers. On the other side of the transaction, a buyer's agent will be likely to estimate a reserve number that's high when attempting to negotiate on an offer on the buyer's behalf. The buyer's agent will want to show the property owner that the property may not be worth quite as much as he or she wants. Once we have all the operating expenses paid by the building owner, we can calculate one of the most important financial numbers on the building, the net operating income or NOI. The effective gross income minus the operating expenses leaves us with a net operating income. Again, this number does not include the debt service. And the debt service, by the way, is a fancy way of saying the principal and interest of the mortgage payment. It does not include any tax depreciation. It does not include uh, immediate capital expenditures like putting a new roof on the building or replacing the facade of a shopping center. Operating expenses are the costs to manage and run the building, and these are costs that recur year after year. Having the net operating income allows us to calculate the cap rate of the building, which is the most often quoted evaluation of any commercial property. The cap rate or capitalization rate is a simple formula used by commercial real estate agents to obtain a rate of return on the buyer's money if the buyer were paying all cash for the property. It's a simple calculation of the net income of the property divided by the sales price. If we want to determine what price to pay for a building, we have to look again at competing buildings that have sold recently. What was their net operating income? What was the sales price? Divide that net operating income, or NOI, by the sales price, and you've got a cap rate. So let's work through another example. Let's say we're trying to value a 10-unit apartment building, and we're able to find three recently sold comparable buildings in the marketplace. We do a quick calculation on each, dividing the net operating income by the sales price to find the cap rates of each building, and we find they have cap rates of 8, 8.2, and 8.3 respectively. Our subject property that we're trying to price contains 10 units. Each unit is rented at $1,000 a month, so our scheduled gross income is $10,000 a month or $120,000 a year. We speak with our local lenders and find out that the average vacancy rate is 7%, so we take 7% off that $120,000 a year to get our effective gross income at $111,600. The current owner shows total operating expenses at $24,300 per year, which leaves our net operating income at $87,300.
A good realtor at this point might look closely at the three comparable sales and determine why one might have been able to do better on cap rate than another. And remember that price and cap rates are inversely related. The lower the cap rate, the higher the property value. But we've got a tight range here of 8 to 8.3 percent cap rates. Dividing $87,300 by 8 percent gives us an estimated value of $1.09 million. At 8.3 percent cap rate, dividing that $87,300 net operating income by 8.3 gives us an estimated value of $1.05 million. So we have a rough range of values. Sometimes there's an outlier in the list of comps we use. That happens when a property is a distress sale, like a foreclosure or a short sale, or someone who needs to sell to meet a deadline. Or sometimes a building needs a lot of work, or maybe it's sold to a relative. Or maybe the building is sold to someone who really needs that particular building for some reason and is willing to pay a premium for it. If there is an outlier, you have to make a few calls to understand the situation, or you might just want to leave it out of your analysis. So we know what a cap rate is, the net operating income divided by the sales price, but what does that really mean? In college, you might have learned the IRV formula, the IRV formula. It means that income equals the rate of return on an investment, R, times the value of the investment. Income equals rate times value. Moving the equation around with a tiny little bit of algebra, that also means that the rate of return you receive on an investment is equal to the income divided by the value or by the investment that you made. So if you have an income of $1,000 a year on some annuity that you invested $10,000 in, your rate of return is $1,000 divided by 10,000, or a 10% rate of return. If instead you put $100 into a savings account with your bank, and in a year you get back, well, a dollar, divide that dollar by 100 that you put into the account, and you'll see your rate of return on that bank account is 1%. You should have invested in real estate instead. In the world of real estate, this rate of return is called a cap rate. The cap rate is calculated by taking the income, or the NOI, and dividing by invested or the sales price of the property. So once again, because I really want you to get this, if you have a net operating income of $25,000 a year and a sales price of $250,000, your cap rate is 10%. A cap rate is probably not the investor's real rate of a return because the cap rate assumes that you're paying all cash for the property and you're not investing anything in closing costs or improvements. A cap rate is also a snapshot in time because the income may rise or fall, so the return rate is only for the income you're receiving right now. So why use it? Commercial and investment real estate comes in all shapes and sizes, and a simple calculation allows us to compare the returns of properties in a common language. You only really need to know two numbers, the property's price and the net operating income and you can create a thumbnail sketch of one building against another. So let's do a quick example. Your client, Peter Parker, would like to buy an investment property. He wants a cap rate of at least 10% and would also like to change his name to something else. The net income on the property he's considering is $89,000. What is the maximum he would be willing to pay? The answer is to simply divide the net income by the required cap rate. I told you that the cap rate equals the net operating income divided by the price, a little math, and you'll see that the price equals the net operating income divided by the required cap rate. So $89,000 net operating income divided by a 10% cap rate gives us a maximum offering price of $890,000. Again, a lower cap rate means a higher value. If we're willing to buy that $89,000 stream of income on an 8 cap instead of a 10, We'll divide that 89,000 by 0.08 or by 8%, and we now get 1.11 million. That change of 2% cap rate raises the value of the property by more than $220,000. Investors are going to pay a premium in some areas. New York City is an area where investors will pay a premium by purchasing at a lower cap rate. Think of it as risky investment versus non risky investment. If you're investing in U.S. bonds backed by the full faith of the U.S. government, they're supposed to be nearly risk-free, so you buy them at a very low return. If you invest in a country where there's a civil war going on, you might want a bit higher return for the risk you're taking with your investment capital. Buildings work the same way. If you're buying a building that's leased to CVS for the next 25 years, 
and that CVS is covering all expenses such as taxes, insurance, and maintenance, so you're effectively purchasing an income stream, you might be more willing to buy at a lower cap rate than if you're purchasing a strip mall built in the 1970s in a coal mining town where the stores may become vacant. You'll get a higher cap rate and thus a higher return because there's more risk. Obviously, buyers want a higher cap rate and sellers want a low cap rate. Now, we've compared properties by gross rent multiplier and by cap rate. The next level is to figure out what kind of actual cash on cash return an investor might realize on a purchase. A cash on cash return is the actual cash return an investor receives on the actual cash the investor put into the building. So if the investor puts in $50,000 into the purchase and receives $5,000 in cash return on the building after paying the mortgage, he's received a cash on cash return of 10%. But to figure out this return, we need to do a little bit more math. A cap rate is based on buying a building all cash and doesn't include closing costs. We need to figure out how much total cash an investor is putting into the property or an initial investment and how much cash that investor is taking out after the mortgage payment. The initial investment is generally just the down payment plus the buyer's closing costs or other acquisition costs, although it could include some property repairs and upgrades. It's the cash the buyer lays out when purchasing and taking possession of the property. A buyer may be putting down 20% on a $400,000 building, which is $80,000 and they may have an additional $20,000 for appraisal, attorney's fees, transfer taxes, and so on. If that buyer is not doing any repairs or upgrades, the initial investment is $100,000. The net cash flow, then, is simply the net operating income less the mortgage payment, again, also known as the debt service. So let's go back through our formula. Gross scheduled income minus a vacancy factor and any rent abatements is the effective gross income. The effective gross income minus any owner expenses gives us a net operating income. And subtracting our debt service or our mortgage principal and interest from the net operating income gives us the net cash flow before taxes. In our example, let's set the price on this 10 unit building of $950,000. We had a gross scheduled income of $120,000 less a vacancy rate of 7% left us an effective gross income of $111,600. We had operating expenses of $24,300, so our net operating income is $87,300. The cap rate is the NOI divided by the sales price, or $87,300 divided by $950,000, or a 9.2% cap rate. Let's say we're buying the building with 20% down and 3.5% in closing costs. So our cash investment is $190,000 down payment, and another $78,850 in closing costs, or a total of $268,850. So our cash in is that $268,850. To get our cash out, we have to subtract our mortgage principal and interest, our debt service, from the net operating income. Our debt service is the sum of 12 mortgage payments of $5,015.66 per payment which is borrowing 80% of our purchase price at 5% interest for 20 years. And that number is $60,187.92. So, subtracting the debt service from our $87,300 net operating income leaves us with a net cash flow of, drum roll please, just over $27,000. Divide our cash flow out by the cash we invested, or divide that $27,112 by $268,850, and we get a cash on cash return of 10.1%, which you'll notice is actually higher than our cap rate of 9.2%. So by borrowing money, we're actually making a better return on our money, and we don't have to put up the entire $950,000 in cash. So if you've got a million dollars laying around, rather than buy just this one building with a return of just over 9% based on the cap rate, you can buy maybe four buildings with the same cash outlay and maybe get better than 10% return by making money on borrowed money. That's one of the beauties of real estate investment, and it's called leverage. You're now staring blankly at the screen and deciding whether or not you want to go back to selling residential real estate 
Or maybe you want to go replay my program on marketing commercial real estate and have some fun instead of listing to all this math, aren't you? Don't worry. It'll get a little easier with practice. So let's go a step further. That was the cash flow before income taxes. We call that the CFBT, or cash flow before taxes. You may have a tax liability, or you may receive a tax benefit each year from owning real estate. In order to determine the tax ramifications in the example we're working with, we have to go back to the net operating income before we took off the debt service. We have to start with that NOI instead of the net cash flow because the principal portion of the mortgage payment is not tax deductible. So, we have an NOI of $87,300. We can deduct the interest portion of our debt service and we can also deduct depreciation. The interest portion of our debt service for the first year is $37,484.40. I can go through the amortization schedule to show you how I arrived at that number, but your head probably hurts enough as it is. So we're going to assume the number to be correct. Depreciation depends on whether you're in the United States or another country as you're viewing this program. But in the U.S., a non-residential investment property can be depreciated over 39 years based on a schedule put in place by the IRS. Residential property can be depreciated more quickly, giving you an even greater benefit. And we're going to assume a first-year depreciation of just under 2.5%, or at 2.461% to be precise, which leads me to disclose that I am not an accountant or an attorney, so always seek guidance from professionals when advising a client. Now, each year you'll be able to write off a portion of that building, which is great. The bad news is that we'll have to figure in a recapture of some of that depreciation at the time we sell the building. We'll discuss that in a minute. So 2.461% of the purchase is $23,379.50. Add to that the interest portion of $37,484.40 and we have a total write-off against the building of $60,863.90. So let's go back and take our NOI of $87,300 and deduct this roughly $60,800 and we get a taxable income of $26,436.10. So how much do we pay in income taxes? Now that really depends on your tax bracket. But if you're in say a 33% bracket and you have a taxable income of $26,436.10, you'll owe the IRS about $8,700. That brings your net cash flow after taxes to $17,712.19. And if we take that number and divide it by our initial investment of $268,850, you'll come up with a cash on cash return after taxes of 6.6%. Still a pretty decent return on your money and a whole lot better than your bank would have paid you in your savings account. But wait, you'll also get the benefit of paying down the mortgage on the property, of building up equity, and hopefully receive the benefit of rising rental rates and a rising building value, which we'll also have to take into consideration. Lauren, you might be saying, I sold residential real estate for the last 10 years and I still don't understand all the FHA rules. Do I really have to do all of this for every single client? Well, probably not. Many clients do their own calculation and are really only interested in the cap rate. But that's not a true reflection of what they're making on their investment, is it? A cash-on-cash -cash return is closer to an accurate picture, and there are some great software programs available to help you put these numbers together. But you need to understand where these numbers come from and how they relate in order to accurately advise your clients. But we're not done yet. For some of our clients, particularly firms or institutions, we're going to be projecting cash flows over a period of time, estimating annual returns going forward, and estimating the current value based on that longer-term projection to account for rising property values and rising income and expenses, and what we call the time value of money. Remember that a cap rate is just a snapshot in time. What some investors really want to know is what their real return on their investment will be over some holding period, like, I don't know, 10 or 20 years. Let me explain why this is important. If you invest $10,000 into buying some sort of annuity that pays you back $1,000 a year for the next 10 years, and at the end of that 10-year period, you get some amount that's higher than the $10,000 you initially invested, say $15,000. Your return is greater than just looking at the first year's return. In real estate, you're buying a series of future cash flows. If you decide to purchase and hold a building for 10 years, 
you may get that thousand dollars a year for 10 years. And the building may be worth more than you paid for it when you sell it in 10 years. But you can't just add up all those cash flows and divide by your initial investment in order to understand the return. That's because there's something called the time value of money. You've probably heard this analogy before, but if you loan someone $100 today and they give it back to you in three years, did you lose anything? Well, you got your hundred bucks back, but inflation has eroded some of that. What you can do or buy with $100 today won't be necessarily the same as what you can do or buy with that same $100 in three years because of inflation. So maybe that hundred bucks is only worth $94 in three years. Additionally, you've lost the use of that money for three years. You could have purchased something with it, or more importantly, you could have invested it. So if you took that money and put it into an investment vehicle that compounded over a three-year period, how much would you have made? In order to really understand the investment our client is making and understand the return the building or property is generating, we have to project the income and expenses for the holding period and then discount those future benefits we're going to receive, the future income stream, to what it's worth today. So to create this multi-year cash flow, we're going to need to estimate the holding period for the investment and how much the investor is going to get back when they sell. A buyer may have a predetermined period of time he or she would like to own the property. Each year of this expected holding period, the property generates an annual cash flow. In addition, at the end of the anticipated ownership period, the investor sells the property and generates a property sale cash flow, which we call a reversion. Five factors are necessary in order to create a multi-year cash flow. And a sixth factor is necessary if we're going to discount that value back to today's dollars. First, we need to know the holding period. It has to be identified or estimated. How long does the buyer want to own the building before selling it? Secondly, what's the initial investment? How much is the buyer putting into the project between down payment and closing costs? And is the buyer putting any money into immediate renovations or upgrades? How much are they investing up front? Third, we need to calculate the annual cash flow for the current year. How much is the building earning right now? Fourth, we need to estimate the rate of change of the income of the property and of the expenses. Will they grow at the inflation rate? Will income and expenses grow at the same rate? We're going to have to take an educated guess here. And fifth, we need to estimate what the property will sell for at the end of the holding period so we can calculate the sales proceeds to figure into our total cash flow. And I'll show you how to do that. And sixth, finally, if we're not just evaluating the income stream and the growth in equity, but would also like to figure out what that value to us is today for the income stream, we need to decide what discount rate to use. In other words, what rate should we use to discount our cash flows back to the present day? Remember that time value of money. A dollar received in 10 years is not as valuable to us as a dollar received today. Once we discount all the cash flows back, we come up with one number, that's our value to a client today, and we call that the net present value. And that allows us to calculate something called an internal rate of return. So let's go back to our example of a purchase at $950,000 and start building a multi-year cash flow. We already calculated the first year's income. We had an initial investment of $268,850. And you'll notice I've added a column for year zero to reflect that we had a negative cash flow for that amount because we've invested that amount into the project. We put cash in. Our first year starts with a gross income of $120,000, which generates a net operating income of $87,300 after operating expenses, and a net cash flow after debt service but before taxes of just over $27,000. So how do we project that forward? Unfortunately, there's no crystal ball that will tell you exactly what's going to happen in any particular type of property in any particular marketplace. You'll have to judge the likelihood of potential increases or decreases. If we want realistic numbers, maybe we want to ask ourselves, are the rents currently at market rent, or are they low or high for the market? Do you expect market rents to remain stable in the future? As an example, we were recently showing a building to an investor that had a really good cap rate. It's a net lease to Rite Aid, where Rite Aid, as a single tenant, pays all expenses, including taxes and insurance on the property. But their rental rate per square foot is about 50% higher than the market rent because rates in the neighborhood have declined. Worse, the footprint is of an older pharmacy and newer Rite Aids need more space. 
So when the lease expires in three years, I think they're very likely to move, which means the owner of the property will likely be renting the property at much lower rate than it is today. You have to take that into consideration when projecting income. Are there any pending changes in zoning or employment locally that may affect market rents? Are competing properties in better condition or worse condition than the subject? Will the condition impact the rental of any vacant units? Does the subject need significant repairs which will impact the rents going forward? Are there any major changes occurring in the neighborhood which could affect the property's rental value or desirability? Are there any tax changes or significant utility changes expected that would affect the income stream for the property? Once you have an understanding of the marketplace and the potential changes, you can begin to estimate the future income and expenses. Again, although there are brilliant statisticians in the world who make predictions regularly, there's no magic to estimating future income and expenses. You'll need to determine a realistic growth factor or appreciation for the income and expenses or decline if you believe there's going to be a decrease. Another method to estimate an acceptable appreciation factor is to determine the increase in income and expenses over the prior three to five years and average those increases to find an appreciation factor. That doesn't always work because there are ups and downs in the commercial real estate rental cycle. A deeper analysis of the market might be found by contacting local economic development organizations and appraisers to obtain their view of likely increases in market rents and expenses. In this example, I'm simply plugging in an inflation factor of 2.5%, assuming both the income and expenses of the building will rise at 2.5% per year, which I don't believe is unrealistic in most markets. Using Excel or REIWISE or any projection software, simply apply that increase to your income and your expenses over the holding period. In this case, a 2.5% increase each year actually raises our effective gross income on the building from $111,600 in the first year to over $139,000 in year 10. You'll also have to account in the expense column for any large expenses or capital improvements that will be made during the holding period. In this example, I'm not worried because remember that we're adding $3,000 into a reserve fund every year to cover our expenses. Some investors and realtors will tell me that I'm doing this incorrectly and should add that back in, but I'd rather make sure it's accounted for immediately. To determine possible capital expenses that might alter the cash into the property in a given year, ask yourself, are there any areas of the property that are likely to need major repairs or renovations in the next few years or during the holding period of the property? Are there any pending or anticipated assessments against the property, such as new sewer lines or new sidewalks in the area? We might plug in a capital expense of $20,000 near eight, for example, toward a roof, which I did not use in this example. In more advanced analysis, we actually plug in lease expirations for each office or retail tenant and calculate the likelihood the tenant will renew as a factor into our analysis and figure out how much in tenant improvements we may have to make in order to keep those tenants in the building as their leases expire. Of course, this is an introductory workshop. In this example, you can see how we grew the income and grew the expenses. Since the income is greater than the expenses, we have a better return each year of this projection. The final part of this multi-year cash flow is how we figure out what we're going to sell the property for in year 10. Some realtors simply grow the value of the building at the same rate they grow the income and expenses, or at 2.5% per year compounded. My preference is to figure out what the NOI is in year 10, and then divide it by what I assume the cap rate will be at that point in time. Remember that either way of coming up with sales figure is a guess. In this case, the NOI in year 10 is just over 109,000. Divide by an assumed cap rate of 10%, and we get a sales price of $1.09 million. Now remember, we paid $950,000 for that building 10 years before this. If the cap rate in 10 years was 8% instead of 10%, we'd have a significantly higher value of $1.36 million. And I'm being conservative in this estimate. To get our outgoing cash flow, or our reversion cash flow, we need to deduct the amount that is still owed on the mortgage. A quick amortization calculation shows that we still owe nearly $473,000. Off a sales price of $1.09 million leaves us with a little over $617,000 net cash to us in the sale. Of course, there are probably closing costs to sell, and you should estimate 
and take those off this number to get an accurate picture. The final chart gives us a great overview of what we anticipate happening in the property over the next decade and is a great way to show an investor the income potential as their rents increase, as their loan is paid down, and as the value of the building increases. I'm also going to use this chart to estimate what we call the net present value, NPV, and then calculate the internal rate of return, IRR, of the property. Again, a net present value takes that series of cash flows and with little math, computes what it's worth to you today based on some discount rate. We all understand compounding. If we put $1,000 into a money market with a 10% return, okay, maybe I'm being a little optimistic, but at a 10% return, in five years, we'll have about $1,600 instead of the initial $1,000 we invested because of compounding. The idea of a discount rate is kind of the inverse of growing your investment. We're trying to determine how much less that future money is worth in today's dollars and how much an investor would have made using another investment vehicle. We also call this the investor's required rate of a return. If you assume a discount rate of 10%, then the value receiving $1,000 in one year is worth $909.09 .09 today. Inverting that, if you had $909.09 .09 today and invested it at 10%, you'd receive $1,000 in one year. So before we get started, what should an appropriate discount rate be? A wide variety of methods are used to determine discount rates, but in most cases the calculations seem to be more of an art than a science. I can tell you that large firms often use a weighted average cost of capital after tax, but I don't want to spend the next hour trying to explain that to you. Others may tell you that the discount rate is really a reflection of the opportunity cost of this investment relative to other investments. If I have 250 grand to invest, what are the returns on other investments with similar risk profiles? To simplify the process, you can look online for what other investors are considering the discount rate to be at the present time. You might subscribe to RealtyRates.com and see what their investor surveys estimate an appropriate discount rate to be. Remember that a discount rate is different for different property types, multifamily, office, retail, and it's different for different areas of the country. New York City will have a different level of discount rates than St. Louis or Wichita. You can also find lots of data on the Corpaz report or CBRE and many other large commercial real estate firms produce reports free of charge. A source I often check is PricewaterhouseCooper or PWC.com. They have a comprehensive investor survey to gauge the level of thinking on risk and rates. Again, discount rates vary from property type to property type and location to location. And it's appropriate to adjust the assumed discount rate to compensate for risk opportunity cost or other factors. Let's go back to our example of a purchase at $950,000 and pick a number out of the Price Waterhouse Cooper chart for a Midwestern office building. Our required rate of return or our discount rate is 8%. The way this is calculated might just make your head hurt. The formula for what each year's income is worth in today's dollar when applying the discount rate to this equation on the screen, net present value is the sum of all future cash flows discounted back. The NPV equals cash flow divided by 1 plus the required rate of return to the power of the year in which you receive the cash flow. So if we're looking for the net present value of a cash flow we receive in year 3 based on an 8% discount rate, it's the cash flow divided by 1.08, that's 1, plus the discount rate of 8% to the third power because, well, we're in year 3. Fortunately, there's software out there to figure all this out. But the value of a multi-year cash flow looks something like this. NPV equals the initial cash outlay, which is a negative number because you're putting cash in, plus cash flow over 1.08 to the power of the year of the cash flow, plus the final cash flow from selling the building over 1.08 to the tenth power because that's in year 10. If we apply this formula to our example, the first year's cash flow is over $27,000. But the net present value in today's dollars is about $2,000 less. In this scenario, if we're looking for a discount rate of 8% and we apply that discount rate to all the cash flows, including the final sale of the building, we get a net present value of a hair under $260,000, which is a bit less than we're putting into the building today. So what does that mean? It means that we're not quite hitting that 8% rate of return we'd like in order to meet our investment goals. And by the way, 
just a slight change in the discount rate can dramatically alter our results. If instead of 8%, we use 6% as our target and plugged it back in, we'd get a net present value of over 344000 which is nearly $85,000 more than at 8%. That means we can put up to 344000 into the building and effectively pay more for the building and still hit our target numbers. The Internal Rate of Return, or IRR, is a way to calculate the discount rate which will yield a net present value of zero. It's the rate earned on each dollar invested for each period it's invested. And it answers the question, what rate will an investor achieve given a stream of cash flows? It's used to compare investments by pretending that all the returns are kept in the investment rather than you taking money out. And again, the IRR is something that you'll be asked for by institutional investors. In Excel, you can calculate IRR by typing I equals IRR and then highlight a string of numbers from year 0 through year 10 and close the parentheses. In this case, the IRR of the income stream is 18.26%. Now remember, this is based on leaving all the cash in the investment, but it provides a way to compare one investment vehicle with another. Building a full cash flow model and calculating an internal rate of return is called a discounted cash flow analysis, or a DCF. When you're attending conventions and somebody is asking about one of your listings and wants to know if you did a DCF on it, that's what they're talking about. Also, there's one other reason to consider an internal rate of return in lieu of using a simple cap rate. It helps us to answer the question as to why some investors buy properties at break even or sometimes even at a loss. Why purchase real estate at a 1% return when you can do better purchasing bonds and you don't have all the risk. They're easier to sell if you need cash out. It's because some investors look for properties that have a very strong growth rate. If the investor feels that, although they're buying at a very low cap rate today, they can attain a high IRR, they might be willing to buy for that future benefit. Back to our example. So this one building has a gross rent multiplier of 8.5. It has a cap rate of 9.19% and a cash on cash return of 10.08% and an internal rate of return of over 18%. Whew. I'm going to introduce one more method of calculating return, by the way. It's called debt coverage ratio or debt service coverage ratio. And we usually term it CR. This is a term that's most often used by lenders or banks rather than by investors. But it's a calculation you need to be familiar with because it's a threshold you're likely to need to meet when putting together a commercial sale. The debt coverage ratio, DCR, is equal to the net operating income, NOI, divided by the debt service. If, for example, your investor's NOI on a building is $130,000 and his annual mortgage payments, his debt service, is $100,000, then $130,000 divided by $100,000 gives us a DCR of 1.3. That means the debt on the building is covered by $1.30 for every dollar of debt. What if you have $100,000 in net operating income and $100,000 in debt service? Well, you may have trouble talking your lender into doing the deal, but $100,000 over $100,000 equals 1. It's a 1 to 1 ratio, which is your break-even point or your BEP. Obviously, investors typically want to buy above break-even. Your bank or lender is going to set a DCR or a ratio based on the investor, on the type of property, and on the lender's perceived risk. A lender may require only a DCR of 1.1 or 10% greater NOI than the debt service, or they may require 1.2 or 1.4, depending on the risks. The lender wants to make sure the property can sustain its debt by itself, whether or not the buyer continues to own the property. In the case of our example, the NOI or net operating income is $87,300. Our debt service at 5% for 20 years is $60,000. $187.92 per year. So the debt coverage ratio is 87.3 divided by 60,187, which comes to a DCR of 1.45 or 1.45 to 1. That's a strong ratio and will probably be accepted by virtually any lender. But let's say the income was only 70,000 with a debt service of 60,000. Our DCR would be 70,000 divided by 60,000 or 1.16. If a lender requires a DCR of 1.25, even if our investor is fine with the return on this investment, 
because he or she anticipates a strong growth rate, the lender won't lend the money. The buyer has only two choices. He can either increase his equity position in the property by putting more money down and borrowing less, which will raise the debt coverage ratio, or he can try to buy at a lower price to where the DCR is in line with the bank's requirements. Now, one other possibility is to shop other lenders and find one with reduced requirements. There is variability between lenders and these ratios. Now that you understand the basics of how to do these calculations, what software should you use to do all the math? Well, I have a few friends who actually use HP calculators and do all this by hand, but I really wouldn't recommend that. And you can build your own models in Microsoft Excel. Many of the best off-the-shelf investment analysis programs are actually templates based in Excel. And Excel has powerful features built into it, like internal rate of return, net present value calculations, and other metrics. And the examples we've done for you in this workshop were simply Excel calculations. You just organize a spreadsheet into income, expenses, and returns, and build a model. In fact, in some of the advanced programs you're going to see through Century 21, there is an Excel model from the CCIM Institute called an APOD, or Annual Property Operating Data Form. But as you become more successful in commercial real estate, you'll want to use a more complex software program. I'm going to recommend a product that's pretty affordable called Realnex, formerly called REI Wise. And by the way, Century 21 has an unbelievable deal on this software. You can subscribe to it for less through Century 21 than any competing brand. Realnex is a web-based investment analysis software for projecting income and value. The package includes comprehensive tools for lease analysis, uh, resale valuation, cash flow, and a full range of sensitivity analysis tools, and produces some great client reports. No, I do not get paid for them, although I am willing to be bribed. Rather than building your own Excel model, you'll find software like this allows you to easily enter data on the property like you see on the screen and analyze that data and prepare a presentation. We put in the data in five or six minutes, the same stuff we just put into the Excel spreadsheet, and this slide shows income projections and follows the same cash flow formula, the gross scheduled income or potential gross income, reduced by a vacancy rent or rate, rent abatements and other factors, and next it accounts for the total operating expenses, splits out the net operating income, and then accounts for the loan payment and capital expenses in order to determine a net cash flow and cash on cash return. This is all done automatically. The software has a variety of projections and you can even analyze the price of the property based on a variety of different variables. You can do a sensitivity analysis as to how uh, a different vacancy rate or expense projection might affect or change your bottom line. And you can use this software to build some beautiful reports either for a listing presentation or for an investor package. Certainly shop all the software packages available and see what's right for you. But this is an excellent, excellent software package that I highly recommend. Century 21 also has a deal with the Analyst Pro, which is a great software program that runs as an app on your phone or your Android device or your iPad and it allows you to calculate everything in the field very, very easily. It's accessible from any handheld device. So, before we end today, let's go back through the different forms of income evaluation. Gross rent multiplier, or GRM, is the price over the gross rental income, and it's primarily used by multifamily brokers and owners. We don't use it in most office or retail properties because of the lease structures being far more complex, the expenses are far more complex, and it can be very inaccurate as a measure of value. Cap rate is the NOI over the price and is the most quoted rate of return. The benefits of using this form of evaluation is that it takes into account both income and expenses, and it provides an easy way to compare building to building as if the buyer were purchasing them without a mortgage or without leverage. It's an apples to apples comparison of building returns after operating expenses. The only major shortcoming of this type of evaluation is it doesn't factor in the financing of the building. So it's not a real return that the investor is receiving when they purchase a building. Cash on cash return equals the yield, or the net cash flow after debt service, over the down payment plus closing costs, or the initial investment. Again, the yield equals the NOI minus the debt service. 
This is your real return before taxes and before depreciation. It's a great indicator of return when you're trying to figure out how much you would make on this investment versus putting something into the stock market or into bonds. A cash on cash return evaluation also allows you to test different amounts financed in order to figure out your best return with leverage. Your internal rate of return is your most complex method of evaluation. Every year you have a cash flow and those cash flows need to be discounted back to today's dollars based on something called a discount rate. In order to compare one investment to another, we set the net present value to zero and run a calculation using Excel or Argus or REAMYs or some other software program. Remember that your first year has to include the outlay of cash to buy the building and the last year has to include your net proceeds after you pay off the mortgage. To make this work, you have to accurately predict the property's value at that point, you have to accurately predict the amount you still owe on the building and the cost of sale of the building. You also have to predict inflation of the income and expenses and you have to predict capital expenditures. So if we expect that we have to renovate three commercial units in year five because tenants are leaving, we estimate the cost of those renovations. If we need to replace the roof in year six, we need to estimate the cost and deduct it from our analysis. When I'm at events, some agents tell me that they have never done an IRR calculation and they never will. That may be right, and that's perfectly fine. But my students in New York and Boston and Washington that work for big firms are required to do IRR calculations for their clients on a daily basis. It's used by institutional investors and developers. The downside of the estimate of the return is that you're assuming that the investor puts all their money back into the property or project, which is seldom true. But it does allow a comparison between various investment vehicles. The debt service ratio is a final analysis. Although this is more of a bank or a lender term, it allows us to know how much a lender will finance on a building. And it's critical because the lender will not go above a certain ratio. As a realtor or an investor, you need to understand where that number comes from in order to calculate what amount you need to invest in the property to make the DCR work. DCR again equals the net operating income divided by the debt service. I want to leave you with a few quick quotes. Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Don't let the numbers send you into paralysis of analysis. There are many very successful commercial realtors who don't actually know half of what we talked about today. Go take a shot. Christopher Reeves said, either you decide to stay in the shallow end of the pool or you go out in the ocean. So get out of your comfort zone. Stop hanging in the kitty side of the pool. Get out there and try and list and sell commercial real estate. It's a big market with some big numbers. And finally, George Eliot said, it's never too late to be who you might have been. It's time to step up and be the person you've always wanted to be. Until next time, I'm Lauren Keim, and you've been watching an introduction to commercial real estate valuation and financial analysis with the team at Real Estate's Next Level.